Hello and welcome to Dining with Death. This episode is on my playlist, Deadly Destinations, where we visit the sites of terrible events. Sometimes they're murders and sometimes they're mass murders. Today I'm coming to you from downtown Phoenix, Arizona, where a serial killer stalked the area. I'm gonna take you on a little tour and then of course we're gonna eat here. I'm Stacy Lee, let's begin. Welcome to Phoenix. This sprawling desert city is home to 1.6 million people. It is the fifth largest city in the United States and covers over 500 square miles. 1.6 million people is a lot of people, but that's just Phoenix proper. The greater Phoenix area, which includes Tempe, Mesa, Scottsdale, and too many smaller cities to name, if you include all of those residents, there are five million people here. It gets hot here, and when I say hot, I'm talking hotter than Vegas, hotter than Palm Springs. Phoenix is, in fact, the hottest city in America. It frequently gets 120 degrees plus here in the summer months and never gets much colder than about 70 degrees, maybe in January, but even then, it's t-shirt weather here. The city has an NBA team, the Phoenix Suns. It has a Major League Baseball team, the Diamondbacks, as well as the NFL team, the Cardinals. It has a professional hockey team, the Coyotes, and it's home to the WNBA's Mercury, as well as an indoor football team called the Arizona Rattlers. They love their sports here in Phoenix. My sister and her family has lived here for many years, and the kids have all participated in sports. I don't know how they do it, sweltering in the heat while the kids play baseball and football, but they do it. It's not much hotter here than where I live in Vegas and St. George, but let me tell you, it feels hotter. You feel every single degree over 100 degrees. 120 definitely feels different than 105, but you get used to it. There's lots of shopping here, some really beautiful outdoor shopping centers, and there are a lot of restaurants, some very nice ones. We had dinner here at Mastro's with my darling Leslie, and we had such a good time, we forgot to get a photo. But the food was amazing, and so was the atmosphere. People like to go out to eat here in Phoenix, and they have plenty of options. They do not, however, have plenty of options for water. And well, we don't have time to go into that today, but they're in the same boat as Vegas and St. George, Utah. It's hot as hell, and more and more people move in every year. The problem is there's no water, and there's less and less water every year. It's a huge problem now. It's going to be a catastrophe in years to come. I try not to think about it too much because it just makes me crazy that we aren't doing more about it. Phoenix was established as an agricultural community in 1867 at the confluence of the Salt and Gila Rivers. It was incorporated into a city in 1881, and in 1889 it was designated as the capital of the Arizona Territory. People talk about the five C's that helped Phoenix grow. They are cotton, cattle, citrus, copper, and climate. After World War II, high-tech firms started to move to the valley because their workers loved the year-round summer here, and with air conditioning being more common, it made Phoenix more bearable. Long before those people came, the Hohokam people inhabited the Phoenix area. They had very advanced irrigation canals to take care of themselves and their cattle and horses. They traded extensively with the nearby ancient Pueblans, Mogollon, and Sinigua tribes, and even had routes into Mexico to trade goods. In the early 1800s, the Maricopa and Yuma tribes migrated from Colorado, and there was quite a bit of violence over land as newcomers encroached on the territory of the Hohokam. The tribes still have headquarters here and hold powwows and markets in the area on a regular basis. Phoenix is home to some extraordinary historical landmarks, including Camelback Mountain, which we could do an entire episode on, Heritage Square, the Chinese Cultural Center, and Hunt's Tomb. There is also Steel Indian School Park and Tovrea Castle. It's also home to the Arizona State Fair, which is a huge event that happens every October. There are beautiful skyscrapers, sprawling and luxurious residential areas, and harsh but stunning nature views in this area. When I think of Phoenix, I always think of it as a city kind of on its own. You can reach it by interstate if you come from California, but if you come from the east, you have to take smaller roads to get here. Most large cities, in the west at least, are accessible from interstate freeways on all sides, but Phoenix isn't. Once you get here, of course, it's a giant city with all the features of any other large city, but getting here is pretty desolate. 
There isn't much around Phoenix. We actually come in the back way from Utah. It's a two-lane road that's dotted with little tiny towns along the way. Phoenix is home to Arizona State University, well, Tempe is anyway, and the college is a huge part of that area in the valley. People come here for different reasons, for jobs, sports, family, the weather, college, and they make this melting pot their home. As is the case in every city and town, in every place in the world, not all of them are law-abiding citizens, and Phoenix has its share of crime. A few months back, I covered the newly discovered serial killer called the Zombie Hunter, Brian Patrick Miller, who took victims back in the early 90s and was just recently caught. Then, if you recall, Phoenix also had the serial shooters, Dale Hausner and Samuel Dietman. We're going to cover them on a later date. Phoenix is also home to the Cookski killer, Cleophas Emanuel Cookski, who killed nine people in 2017. They also had another street shooter, Aaron Juan Saucedo, back in 2015 and 2016. But today, we are going to talk about Mark Godot, who came to be known as the Baseline Killer. Mark Godot was born in September of 1964, right here in Phoenix. He was one of 13 children in the family, the second to youngest, to be precise. His family didn't have any money, and life was difficult. Mark's mother died when he was 12. He played football at Corona del Sol High School in Tempe and was good at sports, but he didn't have enough credits to graduate high school. He started getting into trouble when he was about 17. First, he and his brother were accused of assault, but no charges were pressed. By the time Mark was 25, he'd been arrested multiple times for trespassing, driving under the influence, stalking, sexual assault, and kidnapping. He was sentenced to 15 years for assault and an additional 13 years for robbery and was sent away. He did about 13 years in prison and was paroled in 2004. He moved into a house near Baseline, which is a major road in Phoenix, with his wife, Wendy Carr. People in his neighborhood knew that he had been in prison, but he was so well-liked and so charming that no one was concerned about his criminal past. Not even a year after he was released from prison, very serious crimes began to be reported, and they were near the area Mark Godot was living. But those weren't the only crimes being committed, because, you see, as Mark Godot began his crime spree, unbelievably, there were other serial killers operating in the area, and for a while, the police had no idea if they were looking for one man or five. First, on August 6, 2005, a 12-year-old and two teenaged girls were held at gunpoint near a park on 31st Avenue and Baseline. Two of the girls were assaulted during this attack. There were several other sexual assaults and robberies reported in August as well. Then on September 8, 2005, 19-year-old Georgia Thompson was right here, outside of her apartment at 3730 South Mill Avenue. Georgia was walking from the parking lot here towards her building. As she walked alongside these bushes, she was surprised by a man with a gun. She was shot and killed where she stood, and her body was found right here just after the shooting. She had not been robbed or assaulted, simply executed. Police were baffled and had no idea who would want to kill this young woman, who had only been in Phoenix about eight weeks after moving here from Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. It's always so sad and so poignant to stand in these spots where victims took their last breaths. I thought a lot about Georgia while we were here and the life that was stolen from her on that night, just 45 minutes after she'd been having a drink with friends. It's just awful. On September 15, 2005, another sexual assault was reported, and then on the 20th, two sisters were attacked by a man with a gun who assaulted one of the sisters while pressing the gun into her pregnant sister's belly. On the 28th, another robbery at gunpoint occurred. More robberies and assaults occurred in November of 2005. But like I said earlier, along with these assaults and the murder of Georgia Thompson, police were dealing with something else. People were being randomly shot and killed in the streets of Phoenix. That turned out to be a totally different serial killer, a duo actually, and that's a story we will have to cover on a later date. But suffice it to say, the police were beyond frustrated at this point, and the crimes were occurring almost weekly. On December 12, 2005, 39-year-old Tina Washington was on her way home from her job at a preschool. 
A witness watched in horror as a man simply walked up to her, pulled out a gun, and shot her dead behind a fast food restaurant. More robberies and shootings were reported in December, and for a time, police did not have any suspects, and again, no clue that they were looking for multiple serial killers. On February 20, 2006, 38-year-old Romelia Vargas and 34-year-old Myrna Palma Roman were working in their food truck that they always parked right here. As you can see, this is a commercial area. Lots of automotive shops and taco stands and pharmacies, that type of thing. Food trucks do well in these areas because there are plenty of people looking for somewhere to grab a quick lunch. The food truck was called Grill King and the owners like to park here off Buckeye Road. As you can see, there are shops on one side of the road and then on the other side of the road, nothing. It's just a sidewalk and a large vacant lot. A man walked up to the food truck and shot Romelia and Myrna dead inside as they worked. There was no robbery, no assault, just another execution. The police initially believed the murders were drug-related. I don't know if they had evidence to support that theory or if it was just an assumption, but it was later linked to the other attacks. Almost a month went by as the police continued to search for the killer. Then on March 15, 2006, Liliana Sanchez Cabrera, age 20, was leaving her job here at Yoshi's Restaurant on Indian School Road. As you can see, Yoshi's is a small spot here in the corner of a strip mall. A co-worker of Liliana's, a man named Chow Chu, offered to give Liliana a ride home. They walked right here to Chow's car and got inside. Mark Gadot then walked up and pointed a gun at Chow, got in the car, and told him to drive. The car pulled out of this parking lot and went down Indian School Road. At some point, the car stopped outside a fast food restaurant. Liliana was shot dead in the car and then Chow Chu's body was found in an alleyway about a mile from where Liliana was found. He too had been shot in the head. On March 29, 2006, a man called the police. He was working in this area when he saw streaks of blood on the gravel parking lot. As you can see, this area is somewhat secluded, but people had begun smelling a terrible odor. The police came and looked around, but found nothing. About a week later, the same man who'd called the police before went looking again. The odor had become worse. He then found the badly decomposed body of Kristen Nicole Gibbons dumped in a corner. She had been shot in the head. Sofia Nunez was at home taking a bath on April 10th, 2006. Somehow, an old friend of hers, Mark Godot, got into her home. When Sophia's son realized his mom wasn't coming to pick him up from school, he walked. He found his mother dead in the bathtub with a gunshot to her head. On June 29, 2006, 37-year-old Carmen Miranda pulled into this car wash to clean her vehicle. This is in a very busy area, as you can see. There are a lot of people coming and going, and it's just off a busy road. It's not tucked away or somewhere you'd be afraid to stand, even at night. Carmen used the car wash here. She sprayed her car off, and then she pulled towards the back of the car wash to the area where the vacuums are installed. She got out of her car and prepared to clean the inside. She was talking on her cell phone when a man walked up and grabbed her. He dragged her about 100 yards away and shot her behind a barber shop. At this point, police were beyond frustrated, and so was the public. The police released hundreds of pages of documents with 10 names of possible suspects that had mostly been ruled out. The police asked the public to review the documents to see if they could add anything that might help. Police told the public that the baseline killer was posing as a homeless person in some incidents. He wore gloves and even masks at times, and he was very, very dangerous. Several suspects were brought in and questioned, and there was even a man named Jesse Dwayne Mullins that made a false confession. The public was concerned and somewhat angry, and the police were at the end of their rope, but then they got a series of breaks. On September 4, 2006, the Phoenix police announced that they had made an arrest on the sexual assault of the two sisters, and that arrest was based on evidence they found while serving a search warrant on a different matter. The man they arrested was Mark Godot, who was working construction in the area. Mark was charged with attacking the two sisters first because the women were able to easily identify him and pick him out. He went to trial for the assault on the sisters, who were both fantastic witnesses against him. Mark Godot's wife told the press, quote, 
This is a huge miscarriage of justice, and they have an innocent man in prison. This is all a mistake. He shouldn't be in prison for something he didn't do. By December of 2006, police were confident that Mark Godot was the baseline killer. They had been gathering evidence as Mark sat in prison waiting to go to trial on the assault of the sisters. When it was all said and done, prosecutors charged Mark Godot with 74 crimes, including nine counts of first degree murder, five counts of sexual assault, three counts of attempted sexual assault, 10 counts of kidnapping, 12 counts of armed robbery, four counts of attempted armed robbery, three counts of sexual abuse, and several other charges. This is a dangerous and evil man, and he was hiding right in plain sight. These are the kinds of cases that give me nightmares. They are totally random. There's no rhyme or reason to them. You can be washing your car one second and dead at the hands of a madman in a parking lot the next. It's terrifying. In November of 2011, a Maricopa County jury sentenced Mark Godot to death for the nine murders he committed. He had been in prison since 2006. And when he went back to trial, he was convicted of 67 of the 74 felony charges he'd been previously charged with. He was also convicted of the offenses against the two sisters. He filed a petition for post-conviction relief and it was promptly dismissed by the court. Mark Godot sits on death row at the Iman Complex in Florence, Arizona. There is no date set for his execution yet, but the city of Phoenix is a much safer place with him locked away forever. Now, as we always do on this playlist, we take you for a meal in our deadly destination. This is Dining with Death. We've never done breakfast before, so today we decided to do just that. This is The Breakfast Club. It's a very popular place in Phoenix to get your first meal of the day. They have all the breakfast classics along with sandwiches, wraps, salads, and some house favorites. I'm not much of a breakfast person. I do intermittent fasting and don't usually eat until about 11.30 or noon. But you know I love my tea and this place makes a fabulous cup. It comes as loose leaf tea, I chose chamomile, in a French press so you can steep it and press it yourself. It was absolutely fabulous. Nothing better than a great cup of tea, right? I ordered a light breakfast of Irish oats with toppings. It came with raisins and granola and brown sugar and it was delicious. Jason had salmon lox on toast with avocado and he said it was great. I have to be honest with you, it was so, so hot. We stayed just long enough to get a little footage and we bailed. There was no seating inside and we had to get on the road, so this was a quick bite. A quick bite in the beautiful city of Phoenix that sadly has seen more than its fair share of violent crime in the last decade. Thankfully, its citizens are now safe from the monster known as the Baseline Killer. Thank you for joining me today on Dining with Death, Deadly Destinations. Like the video if you liked the video and subscribe to my channel if you want to support me. You can also join my Patreon and there will be some bonus content there. Stay safe and be kind to each other and I'll see you next time on Dining with Death. Bye.